come to the Two Acre Homestead, come along with us on our journey from a small suburban homestead lifestyle to our new lifestyle homesteading in the rural countryside of Southern Arizona. We'll share with you our tips, tricks, successes, and failures from both our past suburban lifestyle to our new rural lifestyle, all on the Two Acre Homestead. Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead. My name is Lisa, and today we are talking about one of my favorite topics of all time, and that is planning the gardening season. If you live in the Northern Hemisphere and you are looking outside your window and you see snow or it's cold, frost, rain, winter is here, but spring is just around the corner. It is creeping up on us really fast. So it's time for us to start planning for the gardening season of 2022. So I know there's a lot of YouTube videos out right now and there's other podcasters that are out and everybody is getting into the nitty gritty of things like, you know, soil amendments to till or not to till. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to do any of that stuff with you because I want this to be as simple as it can possibly be. Because if you are like me, you are looking out at the world today and you see that there are, there's inflation, there's supply chain shortages, there's all kinds of things going on in the world today. And food insecurity is a real thing. And if you've got little mouths to feed, you know you want to have at least some security in your food. So that means you want to have hand to soil this year. That's one of the easiest ways to make sure that you and your family can get some nutrition and um, some food on your plate by growing it yourself. So because I want this to be something that's accessible to everybody, I want to keep this as simple as I possibly can. (coughs) Excuse me. So the first thing that you want to look at, or the first thing that we're going to talk about today is the family size. How big is your family? How old are the people that are in your family? Do they eat a lot? Do they eat a little? How much food do they consume? Those are kind of odd questions, I'm sure, but when you're trying to grow food so that, you know, your family can eat, these are things that you have to think about. Um, So next to that, after that, then we want to talk about how much of a growing area do you have and what is its orientation? That is really important. And the word orientation is what's really important. I think it escapes a lot of people when they're planning their gardens. They don't think about the orientation of their garden, but it's extremely important. And the other thing that we're, the other topic we're going to discuss is growing zones. What is it and why is it so important? And then as a bonus round, we're going to be talking about and explaining some verbiage that you might hear um, over on social media or wherever, where you'll hear people say a kitchen garden, or you'll hear somebody say a potager, or a market garden, or main crop garden. What do those expressions mean? And they're important to know because it will actually help you with your garden planning. Okay. So first topic is the size of your family and how much food they consume. So if you have a small family, 
it would seem like the logical thing would be, well, if you have a small family, you need a small garden. No, that does not, that is not necessarily the case. And the reason why is it's not just the size of your family, but it's how much food do they consume? You could be a small family of four with two teenage boys that will eat you out of house and home. I know that that's something that I'm going to be thinking about in the years to come. So you want to think about not just the size, but how much they eat. Um, Because conversely, right now, I have two boys myself, and they don't consume a whole lot because they're toddlers. So they eat like little birds, Um, but they eat frequently. (laughs) So just just um, a one size does not fit all families. So just because you have a small family does not necessarily equate a small garden. And conversely, a large family does not equate a large garden either because of the same dynamics. The larger the family, you're talking multiple ages. So you may have a family of seven And you may have a teenager and then you may have a newborn or a toddler or several toddlers. I don't know, but only you can answer the size of your family and how much they consume. The other way to look at it is if you're like me, I have two family members who are on property who are older. One consumes lots of vegetables The other family member does not. That particular family member likes to consume more fruit than vegetables. So that also plays a factor when you are planning your garden because that particular family member, since that family member likes to eat a lot of fruit, that means, well, we need to have more fruit planted. And For the other family member that's like myself, that particular person likes to eat more vegetables, then we need to, we need to plant specific vegetables that me and that family member really like to consume. So knowing your family and knowing what they eat and what they don't eat, what they like and what they don't like is very important. If you're like us, we are not very big into tomato-based products. So from time to time, we like things like spaghetti. My kids absolutely cannot stand spaghetti. They, They really don't like it. But what they do like is pesto. Um, so they, they really like pesto. And so what I have to do is I have to grow way more basil so that I can produce pesto because my boys love it to death. So I don't grow as many tomatoes as I maybe imagined I would at this stage in my life. And at this stage in my uh, kids development, I'm not growing as many tomatoes because they don't consume them as much as we would like to. So Again, know what your family likes, know what they like to consume. And then from there, what you can do is you can look at, okay, let's say, for example, your family wants to eat a lot of beans. Well, let's say you want to grow the uh, bush contender beans. Well, you're going to get about 20 bean pods off of each each, uh, plant, or maybe a little bit less than 20. But the point is, is you're going to look up on Google. You're going to say, hmm, my family likes to eat this and this is what they want to grow. So how many plants do I need to grow so that I can harvest either for fresh eating or for preserving throughout the year? So for example, with my family, they absolutely love green beans. So I'm going to be planting 50, yes, five, zero, 50 bush beans. Why? 
because my family loves green beans. They can't get enough of it. So knowing that and knowing how many get produced per each plant helps me to figure out how many plants I need to grow. It's not an exact science and it's not something that if you planted too much, you're, you know, you can give it away to friends or family or preserve it for yourself. If you plant too little, well, that's a different story. If you plant too little, then what you can do, you can always do is plant a little bit more, but get your hand in the soil and give it a try. Nature is not perfect. The natural world does not do everything according to the textbook perfect way. Nature does things perfect according to nature. The reason why I say it that way is you can plant everything textbook. You can do everything by the book and have a complete crop failure. Or you can do everything by the book and have a complete success. In other words, you won't know unless you get out there and try. Try, 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 and try. So give it a try with your family size and talk to your family. Plan with your family. Talk to them. What kind of things would you like for us to grow this year? And give them the opportunity to have some say-so on what may be on their plate. The other thing that you, the other topic that we're talking about is how much growing area do you have and what is its orientation? So I want to talk about the orientation more than the garden size. We're going to get to the garden size in just a minute, but I really want to talk to you guys about the orientation. Most people are taught that you plant your garden in uh, south facing. A northern facing garden is just no good. And there's a lot of truth to that statement. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you looking to build a homestead from the ground up? Or maybe you're looking to build an off-grid dream home, a vacation home, or maybe just a piece of land to call your own. Visit yourcheapland.com to buy rural land in the wide open spaces of southwestern United States. When you visit yourcheapland.com, they're here to help you. And with their help, you can do this. You can take your dream of owning land and make it a reality. Most down payments are only $294, including the document fee. Remember, everyone qualifies for financing at YourCheapLand.com. Head on over to YourCheapLand.com and start making those dreams come true. And now, back to our podcast. If you can, and if wherever possible, plant your garden so that it's oriented towards the southern sky. The reason why is, especially during the summer months, the sun hangs lower in the southern sky than it does in the northern sky. When your garden is um, more north facing, you get a lot of shadowing. Um, and that can be a problem with one exception. If you happen to live in a place like 
the desert. If you live in the desert, and believe me, I have lived for 20 years in the Arizona desert. I've lived in Phoenix, I've lived in Tucson, and now I'm in the rural south of Arizona. It gets really hot. And we used to have this joke that said, when you read the the seed packet and it says full sun, they don't mean Arizona sun. And it's a joke, but it's truth. So you want to think about your climate. If you have a very, very hot climate, then you might want to think about repositioning your garden. And when I say repositioning your garden, repositioning it in such a way that it gets some shade. Now, if that's impossible for you to do, um, there are tips and tricks that I have for your garden orientation. And that is you plant crops that absolutely love the sun and they don't care about how much sun they get. They will thrive and survive in the hottest, most sunniest spot. For example, corn. Corn is one of my favorite things to plant, to shade, to provide shade for other plants that maybe mm, could use some afternoon shade. So that is something that, not to get too complicated, but that is something that you want to think about if you live in a really hot area. And and when I say this, I mean, I'm talking about areas that get like above 105 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is Celsius, but over 105, 110 degrees Fahrenheit over the summer, you want to start thinking about shade because that afternoon sun is just going to bake your plants. It's really going to be hard. It's not impossible because there are a lot of people that grow in Arizona. It's not impossible. It's very likely that you can do it and do it well. But if you can provide your plants with some orientation that will allow them to get some, um, some shade in the afternoon. For the rest, and I am going to include myself in the statement because when I say for the rest of us, I'm including myself because I now live in a growing zone of 8A, so it doesn't get as hot where we live. Um, but for the rest of us, we it's best for us to have our gardens pointing south um, to get as much sun as they possibly can. And now when it comes to your growing area, the size of your garden, little gardens can produce, they can just produce a lot of food. Do not look at your backyard or look at your, um, wherever your garden is and say, oh, it's really small. I'm not going to be able to produce a lot. Yes, you can. If you have a small garden, you need to look up crop rotation and, um, I'm sorry, not crop rotation, but planting intensive planting because you can do things like square foot gardening, which is a form of intensive planting where you're planting things that um, your plants are in close proximity to each other. Um, And also when a plant dies, always having something ready to be put in its spot, Uh, a replacement plant ready and willing to go in at all times. Um, 
that is probably one of the most important things when you are growing in a small area is that crop rotation, that intensive gardening. And the more intensive the gardening is, you really want to make sure you are using really good soil. Go out, get yourself the best soil that you can afford. And the probably the best soil for you out there is for you to make it yourself, to compost your own um, and make your own compost and add it to your soil. But if you can't get some good gardening compost, um, some of the things I like to use is mushroom compost. Um, uh, some people will use manure. I, I hesitate on manure. I hesitate recommending manure because you really want to make sure if you go out and get manure, A, is it composted down? Do you need to compost it? And B, the other thing you really need to pay attention to is what have they fed that animal? Has that animal eaten something that has been sprayed that will kill your garden? I've seen, I've never had that happen to myself. I've seen it happen to other people and it's devastating. So be careful with your manures. Make sure you're sourcing it from a good, uh, good place, a good source. Um, and know what the background of it is. But a small garden can really produce a lot of food. So don't be afraid of your small gardens. But my pro tip for small gardens is always have plants ready to replace dying plants in your garden. So for example, you're getting towards the end of the gardening season and you've got a cucumber plant that has, it's produced everything that it needed to produce. Yank that thing out. Don't be afraid to take it out. Take out that cucumber plant and plant some salad, plant some, um, some lettuce in its place. Um, you're heading into the winter season. The weather's cooling down. Take out your tomatoes, plant some celery. Um, you have to be fearless when you have a small garden because a lot of times the smaller the garden, the more you are the one who's dictating when that plant is finished, as opposed to when you have a larger garden, the plant dictates when it's done because you have more room. And so you don't have to worry about the intensity, um, and the rotation of your, um, garden space. The larger the garden, like I just got done saying, um, the garden kind of can dictate what it wants to do, but the larger the garden, the more problems I have found. And I will say the problems that I have found are problems with, uh, bird pressure, birds eating seeds, birds eating um, leaves, so forth, voles. That's a huge problem. Um, And any other critter and pest that's out there. And the reason why, especially when you're on acreage, we tend to move our main gardens, our big gardens, a little bit away from the house. So you're not seeing it as frequently as somebody who has a small backyard and they can dip out onto their patio and see, oh, you know, there's a hornworm on my tomatoes. Well, by the time, if you have a really large garden and you're gardening on acreage, by the time you get out there, the hornworm might have decimated your tomato crop. So when you have a small garden, or uh, excuse me, when you have a large garden, you want to really try your best to be out in that garden every single day. I know it's hard. Um, I am totally anticipating it's going to be really difficult for us this year, 
But um, you want to be out there every single day because that's how you're going to catch the pest. That's how you're going to catch who's nibbling on what is by observing your garden. So the garden space, the bigger the garden, the more you need to observe that garden. And it just seems like the smaller the garden, you already observe it by default. So that's one thing that you have in your favor. So hopefully that helps when you're planning out your garden. Should you go big or should you go small? It depends on your time, how much time you have, how much physical space you have, and working within those two realms, your time and your space and your energy too. And the other topic is growing zones. I labeled this as growing zones, but really what I I am talking about is your last, your first and your last frost dates. Each growing zone, especially if you're in the United States, it's the USDA growing hardiness zone. And these hardiness zones were established based on the last frost state in a specific area. So I'm going to use Arizona as an example. It is interesting that we have gone from growing zone 9B to growing zone 9A, and now we are in growing zone 8A, (laughs) all within a very similar region. Um, we're still in Southern Arizona, but we have changed that many times in our moves. The the growing zones is just completely different. Our last frost date, I believe is, uh, April 10th is what I think it is here. And I'm doing that off the top of my, my head. I believe it's April 10th here, um, where we live. And so What that means and why that is so important is plants that do not like the cold, plants that will actually die when there's a frost, those plants can be planted out into your garden after your last frost state. That's why it's so important. So when you're growing from seed, it's important for you to look at how many days does it take to germinate. So you can you will only see that on the back of a seed packet. So let's say let's say you're planting a seed and it takes 14 days to germinate. Well, you know that if you're planting that seed directly in the ground outside, then you want to wait until after your last frost date within 14 days, that seed will germinate. And the theory is that you will not have to worry about any frost coming and killing your plant. That's the theory. What the seed packets don't take into consideration, and it's absolutely impossible for them to do, is climate change. It's a real thing. I'm not here for the politics. I'm here for the gardening. But it is a real thing. Some areas are getting colder. Some areas are getting hotter. And it just depends on where you are. If you are a gardener, pay attention to the weather. My advice to you Know your last frost date. Know your first frost date. Your last frost date usually happens in the fall, by the way. So um, November, um, I believe our last frost date is in November. I have to look it up again. Um, But our last frost date, I believe, is something like November 1st. So we have a very long growing season. Within that growing season, I can plant a whole bunch of stuff. But when it comes to the last frost date, I want to make sure that everything that cannot survive a frost 
is out of my garden. Conversely, the beginning of the frost state, your first frost state, if you're planting from seed, you want to make sure that those particular plants are not seed in ground until after the frost date. Now, if you're planting from seed and let's say you're wanting to grow your your seedlings indoors, like I do, I grow mine indoors. I have my seeds um, sitting on top of heat mats because really your plants are sensitive to the soil temperature. So there's two factors that go on with your seeds. It's soil temperature and air temperature. Not all plants are sensitive to the air temperature. Some plants, for example, bok choy, they, those plants are not sensitive to the air. They're sensitive to the soil. If the soil gets like if the soil freezes, it's not going to, it's not going to grow. Or if it does grow, it'll be severely stunted. So you want to pay attention to your first, your last, and your soil temperature. Well, how do you know what your soil temperature is? The basic rule of thumb, I would say, is pay attention to your overnight lows. If your overnight lows are below freezing, then it's probably too soon to put seedlings out. If your overnight temperatures are anywhere between the 40s and 50s, you should be fine to put most, if not all, seedlings out at that time. Some seedlings can withstand a little bit of frost. For example, bok choy can stand a little bit of frost. As a matter of fact, it likes it. Celery is another one. Lettuce is another one. Kale, all of your kales, all of your brassicas, all of that family, um, the brassica family, which includes your broccoli, cabbage, kale, um, kohlrabis, all of those, they can take some frost. My suggestion to you is to cover it. Put a little bit of a row cover or some sort of cover over those plants so that they don't get too frosted. But I wouldn't put it out if your soil temp or your overnight lows are still dipping into the 30s at night. I would not put any seedlings, not even the brassicas. I would not put them out until after you hit closer to your 40s. So hopefully that answers that question as far as planning. So when you're planning for your growing zone, you want to look at your first and your last frost date. That is your window of time to grow most of your food. Plan accordingly within that time frame. So example, again, for myself, for us, April to November is our growing season here where we are. I don't know where it is where you are, but it's according to your first and your last frost date. Now we get to the bonus round. So the bonus round, I'm going to explain some terms that you guys hear on social media, whether it be YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok, whatever. You're, you probably have heard some of these terms. So a kitchen garden versus a potager. Okay. Some people are not, I I happen to speak French, so I am going to say it the correct way, potager. A kitchen garden and a potager, or a potager, as some people will say, they are one in the same. And as the name implies, it is a garden for the kitchen. So 
a kitchen garden means those are things that you are growing in that garden that are for fresh eating. So a lot of times people, myself included, I put all of my herbs in my kitchen garden. Why? Because I am, that is the garden that is closest to the house. So for this house that we live in, it's on right on the back, back door. As soon as you hit the patio, you are to the left, you are in the potager garden. And from that garden, I can clip salad. I have thyme growing there. I have all kinds of herbs already planted and ready to go. Um, and I'm still getting it set up as we speak, but, um, that is getting, that is getting into a, what is a kitchen garden. A potager garden goes with the word potage, which means soup. So, and this is in French. So anything that you would add to your soup. So like your leeks, herbs, um, herb de Provence, um, any of those type of things that you're going to add, it's a potager. So those are the things that you would add to your soup. So those are the things that you're just going to run out barefoot, clip, 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 add to your soup, and voila, you have a soup. So it's the same concept. It's just French. Um, so it's a kitchen garden and a potager. They are one and the same. The other two terms I hear people throw around, and I must admit, I am very guilty of using these interchangeably, and I've tried very hard on this podcast today not to use them interchangeably, or not to use them even at all, and that is market garden versus a main crop garden. Okay. Okay. So sometimes you will hear people say, oh, I'm growing such and such down in the market garden. And then you might think, oh, so they grow things to sell at the farmer's market? Perhaps. Sometimes they do. Um, and then sometimes they don't. What they mean by a market garden is these are the things that we are growing that we would buy at a market and we are producing them in mass. That's a lot of times what people are talking about. The same concept with a main crop garden. That is a term my husband and I use a lot. We will usually talk about either the potager or the main crop garden. Um, and the main crop garden is just that. That is the garden where you are producing en masse. And usually it's not just en masse, but it's also for preserving during the winter months. So it is a very big or very large production area. And typically the main crop garden or market gardens typically are a little bit away from the house. So it's not something that you frequent. You should be frequenting it. You should be visiting it every single day. But because it's so large, sometimes in our designs, we will put it a little bit away from the house as opposed to the potager or the um, kitchen garden, which is right close to the house. Another garden type that I did not list, and that is herb garden. Some people will grow just an herb garden specifically for medicinal, um, medicinal and for culinary herbs. That is something that is on my to-do list. It's not going to happen this year, unfortunately because I have a lot to plan this year, but I believe next year that is something that is going to be my focus is a medicinal garden. Um, but yes, some people do keep herb gardens and flower gardens as well. 
I hope that this kind of simplifies things for you. I know this was a very long podcast today, but hopefully you can take away your family size, plant what you eat, know how much your family consumes, how much of a growing area you have, what your your orientation of your garden is, very important. And knowing your growing zone, or better said, knowing what your first and last frost date is, because that will tell you your growing time period that you have. So hopefully this podcast finds you and your family well and happy planning, my friends. Put your hand to the soil and you don't know what's going to bloom, but you know it's going to be good. Stay safe out there.